softly and tenderly Jesus is calling calling for you and for me see on the portals he's waiting and watching watching for you we're gonna be in the gospel of mark once again and uh, it's been a great series so far i hope you've enjoyed it and learned some new things to apply into your life and let me encourage you uh, be prepared at the end of our service we do a one minute takeaway and so Write down in one minute what God is saying to you at this point in time, whether it's through the music or through the reading of the scripture or, or something that, that the Lord uses me to say. But nonetheless, be ready to accept something from the Lord this morning. I'm gonna, we're going to skip over a few things, but let me kind of highlight them as we go along. Again, we're, we're not going to be able to do a complete expository of Mark uh, the Gospel of Mark. So we left off, Jesus had done the parable of uh, the soils, and he basically laid out this is the most important parable out there. If you don't get this, you're not going to get anything else. He went on to, to tell a few other parables about a candle and growth and the mustard seed. And uh, the next thing we see is that Jesus calms a storm. Now we're going to see this happen a couple times in Mark. This is the first instance. And so a storm comes up at the end of chapter 4, and Jesus expresses uh, control over the elements, over weather itself. And uh, this won't be on the screen, but I like what these guys say. They feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Who is this guy that nature itself would listen to him? It's pretty incredible. In Mark chapter 5, we meet three people who are in a desperate situation. Absolutely desperate. And um, we're not going to dwell so much on the first guy. I've talked about him before, I think, last year. And this was the, the guy known as the maniac of Gadara, or the demoniac. This man that was possessed, and Jesus shows up. And if you're familiar with this passage, if you're not, let me encourage you to read it uh, this week. But this man comes with an unclean spirit, and essentially Jesus casts these demons out. So not only does he have control over nature, he has control over spiritual forces we can't see. And um, this man gets healed. Now, this man was known in his community. This guy lived in the graveyard, and they had tried to control this guy before. They had tried to, at least on their end, help this guy, and every attempt they had failed. And they just kind of left him off to himself. So society had nothing to offer this guy. So when Jesus shows up and has this encounter, uh, this man gets healed uh, of his possession. And when he goes back to town, the people are scared to death of Jesus and scared to death of this man. Now, what I didn't tell you is when Jesus casts these demons out, the demons go into a, 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 a herd of, of pigs and they go over a cliff and drown. Now, again, if, if you were the guy in charge of the pigs, you probably lost your job that day. <laughs> Just say, that's a bad day at work. How was your day at work, honey? Well, uh, you don't want to know. You just simply don't want to know. And so they go back, and the people there, now, up until this time, everybody's pumped when Jesus shows up, right? It says that he's now famous, and these thousands of people want to hear him speak. So when Jesus gets back to the town where this man is from, they say, you need to leave. We, we do not want you here. Maybe they're worried about more animals dying. We don't know the exact reason, but they didn't want Jesus. And one of the lessons in this passage is that Jesus will not stay where he is not welcomed. If you don't want Jesus, he says, okay. All right. I'm not forcing myself on you. You, you made your decision. He leaves, and the guy that was possessed wanted to follow Jesus. He said, I want to go with you wherever you go. And who could blame him? This man had been living in, in, in basically a living hell for several years. And Jesus shows up, changes his life. And of course, he's like, I want to go with you. Take me with you. And Jesus says, no, you stay here and you tell everyone what I did for you. You serve me right where you're at. And that's exactly what the guy does. Which leads us, Jesus leaves Gadara, he gets on the boat, and he goes to the other side, back towards Capernaum. Now, if you're not familiar with Capernaum, this has been popping up a lot here in Mark, uh, in the Gospel of Mark. 
This is Jesus' I'm wrestling here. Sorry about that. This is Jesus' main hub. This is where he spends most of his time teaching and doing different miracles. So he heads back, and it leads us uh, to Mark chapter 5 and verse 22, which we'll see in just a second. But one of the things I want to point out to you is that as Mark's writing these things, he's wanting his readers to know that Jesus is everything he claimed to be. And he does this by stating these different miracles that Jesus did. Now, Jesus could have, have expressed his deity in several different ways. But one way he chose to do it was by performing miracles and doing things that no one had ever seen or heard of in their entire life. And he's going to do something that had never been done before in this chapter, as we're going to see. In fact, when John the Baptist was in prison, remember that when, when John gets thrown in prison and he starts to doubt, and he says to his, some of his followers, he says, go talk to Jesus and ask him this question, are you really the one? Are you really God in the flesh? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that, that Scripture talks about? Are you him? And Jesus' response to John the Baptist was he just spats off a list, a list of miracles that he did. He said, you tell John that the blind see, the lepers are healed, the dead are raised, and the poor are made power, powerful. He says, we've got all these things, you tell him this, and he'll know. So they give that message back to John, and he knows that Jesus is everything that he claimed to be. And so <clears throat> Jesus now heads to Capernaum, and he's met by a multitude, and this is not uncommon. But if you remember, Jesus is not impressed by the multitudes. He's not impressed that thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people show up to hear him speak or to see him perform miracles. Because most of them, unfortunately, don't want Jesus as the Lord of their life. They don't see him that way. Probably a lot of the crowd is believing the religious leaders. Religious leaders are in their ears saying, he's doing this because of the devil. This isn't the real guy. This isn't the Messiah. And so a lot of them are like, well, those guys are the religious leaders of our time. We're going to listen to them. Others are treating him like a glorified David Copperfield. They just want to see something cool. And they were just there for the show. Unfortunately, there are very few people who go there to interact with Jesus through faith. And so we're going to meet two people in this multitude that react to Christ with faith. Now, these people couldn't be any more different. I mean, they are on the opposite ends of the spectrum. You have one guy named Jairus, as we're going to see. Jairus is rich. This lady we're going to meet, she's poor. Jairus is respected. This lady we're going to see is, is rejected and she's neglected. Jairus is honored in his community while this lady is ashamed in her community. Jairus is a leader in the synagogue. This lady, because of her condition, as we're going to learn, can't even go to the synagogue. She's excommunicated. The last 12 years of Jairus' life have been pretty good, been pretty exciting. The last 12 years of this woman's life have been a living nightmare. So we have like opposite ends here. And it, it, again, it just reinforces some things about Jesus. He's here to deal with us no matter where we're at, whatever stage of our life, rich, poor, uh, healthy, unhealthy, honored, ashamed. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whatsoever. So let me preface before we get here to verse 22. I want you to imagine something with me. I'm going to move this up here. So I don't bump it anymore. There we go. Much better. Imagine this. How many got kids? All right. A lot of people got kids. Awesome. What's, what's every parent's nightmare? Go ahead. What's every parent's nightmare? Just shout it out. Something happening to your child. Now picture this. We have this guy, Jairus. Wakes up in the morning. Does his normal routine. Brushes his teeth. Gets his cup of coffee. He's up before his family, and so he goes into his living room. He's chilling out, probably watching some sports center of that time of some sort. And he hears a scream come out of his, one of the back rooms, like a blood-curdling scream that would shake any parent to their very core. And so he runs back uh, to, to the bedroom, last bedroom on the left. is his daughter's. His wife is in there, and she said, she's not responding to me. She's not waking up. 
And so they check her and she's breathing, her heart's beating, but obviously something is not normal. And you get, you can get this, if you've got kids, you get this pit in your stomach, like, oh my goodness, what, what are we going to do? Now take, take, keep in mind, in Jesus' day, medical technology is so primitive. And they're like, what, what can we do? This is their living nightmare right now. His wife turns to Jairus and says, Jairus, you've got to do something. What, am I, what can I do? My hand, I, we could take them uh, to the doctor, but they're not going to wake her up. Maybe we just wait this out for a little bit. Maybe she'll get better here in an hour or so. Nothing. And so this extreme panic has set in. And we find Jairus doing something most of the religious leaders didn't do. He knows who Jesus is. And he heard that Jesus has just showed up. And so he thinks if anybody can do something, it's got to be this guy. It's got to be him. Which brings us to verse 22. Let's take a look at it. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. A couple things to keep in mind real fast. First of all, we learned some really cool things about Jesus just through the, the, these few verses. One is that Jesus was always accessible. You ever notice that? I mean, he's always accessible to the people. If they wanted to get to him, they could. They just had to go through a big crowd of people. But nonetheless, Jesus is completely accessible, which means he is also approachable. There's something we need to keep a uh, key for ourselves and our personal lives as Christians is to be accessible for people to talk to us. That's why it's important for Christians not to be jerks. Really, there's some Christians who are jerks. I'm not saying they're in here. All right. I love you guys. I have problems with Tom from time to time. But other than that. No, but really, we are to love everyone as Christ loved them. I mean, the, the commandments, love God with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself, to be expressed by love. And so we as followers of Jesus need to also be accessible to everyone, approachable to everyone, so that if someone around us has a need, they feel comfortable talking to us about it, asking us to pray for them. Be accessible. It's not like Jesus didn't have things to do, right? It's not like he didn't have a crazy busy schedule. But he's not in a rush. It's like, okay, what have you got? But let's keep going here. We have Jairus. It says he's a ruler of the synagogue, which basically meant he was uh, not necessarily one of the teachers of the synagogue. He's more of an administrator. He made sure the building was taken care of, that they had teachers lined up. He would have been probably wealthy, well-respected, a very well-respected religious man in the community. People held him at a high standard or else he would not have this job. And so for him to come before Christ, not only does he come to Christ for help, he bows at his feet, which is like, are you kidding me? What is he? And again, Jairus' peers hate Jesus. These, his peers, his friends, are ultimately the ones that, that sign the death warrant. They want Jesus dead. So what Jairus doing this is, is shocking. He makes his way through the crowd, bursts through, and he's, he's like, you've got to help my daughter. He runs into a familiar problem, doesn't he? It's the problem of death. Everybody's got that problem. Psalm 55 says this, take a look. My heart is sore pained within me. And the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. It scares us. Even as a Christian, there's a certain element of fear, I think, when it comes with death. I've never died, so I obviously don't know what that feels like. I don't know what that transition is like. I know where my home is in heaven, absolutely. But I would be lying if I said there wasn't a certain amount of a fear there, maybe fear of the unknown, of the feelings and, and the transition and all of that. But I, I know who I believed and who I've trust with my salvation, and he is able to keep me, obviously. Even this psalmist writing, 
who's a follower of the Lord. He says, it, it pains me. I like John MacArthur. He quoted a Canadian scientist by the name of G.B. Hardy. And G.B. Hardy uh, was not a believer. He, when he went to uh, study the religions, he was only going to ask two questions. And I'll quote from G.B. Hardy. He said, when I looked at religion, I said, I have two questions. One, has anybody ever conquered death? And two, if they have, did they make a way for me to conquer death? Those are the only two questions this guy was concerned about. And really, that's the only two questions we should be concerned about. He said, I checked the tomb of Buddha and it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Confucius, it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Muhammad, it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Jesus and it was empty. And I said, there is one who conquered death. And I asked the second question, did he make a way for me to do it? And I opened the Bible and discover that he said, because I live, you shall live also. Death has a fearful element to it, but ultimately, we follow the one who conquered it. Think about it. Every religious leader who's ever walked the face of the earth has died. Only one of them resurrected. That's pretty cool, if you ask me. So this man has run into a problem. Jairus, no doubt, heard Jesus speak on occasion. He's the ruler of the synagogue. Maybe he was the guy who said, yeah, Jesus, uh, you want to speak at synagogue? That's cool. We'll have you come speak early on in Jesus' ministry. Remember in chapter 1 when they're in the synagogue and Jesus is preaching and a possessed guy interrupts the service like halfway through? Jesus casts the demons out of that guy? That was our first uh, message in this series. No doubt Jairus was there thinking, whoa, not seen that before. No doubt he heard about, in chapter 2, if you remember, those four guys and their friend. They wanted their friend to be healed by Christ. They couldn't get in through the door. They couldn't get in through the window, so they put a hole in the roof. Maybe, maybe just maybe Jairus was in that house. It said some of the religious leaders were there. So maybe he was there, and he saw that guy come down, and Jesus starts off by saying, your sins are forgiven. And Jairus was probably like, only God can do that. And, of course, we know what Jesus did next. To prove he forgave that guy's sins, he says, get up and walk. This man was paralyzed. So he had seen, no doubt seen Jesus do some pretty incredible things. And so when it came to this situation in his life, when there was utter desperation, he doesn't turn to his friends, he doesn't turn to his own faith, he turns to faith in Christ. And so they're on their way. Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to help you. And you can imagine, maybe there's some big relief coming over Jairus right now. Like, all right, we're going to be fine. And as they're on their way, Jesus gets, gets uh, well, something happens. Let's take a look. Verse 25. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of physicians, of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. This woman has a female issue that really has, for the past 12 years, ruined her life. Like, well, what do you mean? Well, because of this issue, according to Levitical law, She's not allowed to worship in synagogue. She would be considered unclean. And anyone she would touch would be considered unclean, according to the law. And so, as far as society is concerned, as far as her faith is concerned, she has been, for the most part, an outcast. But think about what Jesus is headed to do. We have a dying girl, and something cool about Jesus, not only is he accessible to us, he also allows himself to be interrupted. He allows changes of plans. We often don't like that. We're often very busy, and we've got things we need to accomplish. And when an interruption occurs, it really messes up our day. Do you ever think some of the interruptions in your life might be divine? It might be God puts you in a specific place for a specific purpose. Just maybe. Maybe. Jesus allows himself to be interrupted. Let me ask you a question. In our passage, what was the woman's name? What was her name? Give it to me. Anybody? Yeah, she didn't have a name. There was no name given. 
It says a certain woman which had an issue of blood. We know Jairus' name, don't we? It's unfortunate, but for, for this lady, for the past 12 years, she was defined by her issue, not by who she really was. That's the lady you got to stay away from. Different people, unfortunately, were also labeled in that sense. So if we looked earlier in Mark 5, Mark 5, we don't know the name of the guy who was possessed. He was just that crazy guy who lives on the edge of town. The paralyzed man in chapter 2, we don't know his name. We just knew he was paralyzed. This is the guy who can't walk. They are consistently defined by their issue. And I think one of the points Jesus is making is that our issues do not define us whatsoever. Maybe you've got some issues right now, spiritually or otherwise. And you're thinking, how could God possibly use me, Brent? How could I possibly worship? How could I possibly serve? You're bigger than your issues because your God is bigger than your issues. Whatever hang-ups you have, we have a God who loves us who doesn't mind being interrupted. You don't have to be defined as the couple that got divorced or the girl who had an abortion or so on or the, or the preacher who failed morally. You know some of them. But more importantly, there's someone that God can transform, someone that God can ultimately use. God can take the clay and he can mold it and he can do incredible things with it. We're not defined by our issues, church. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. That's who I am. But unfortunately, this lady had woken up every single day for the past 12 years, and her life was consumed by her issue. She spent all her money on it. All her money on doctors, and it didn't do any good. And so what she does takes some risk. She was, again, taking a huge risk here. She was going to go and touch the garment of a rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi, meaning he was a teacher. And you would have known Jesus was a rabbi because of some of the clothes the rabbis wore. No doubt Jesus maybe had some of the tassels on, on the bottom of his clothing, signifying that he was a teacher. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But at this point, everybody knows he's a teacher. And for her to go and touch his clothing, you know what that would do to anybody else? And even Jesus? Yeah, make, her un make him unclean. Make Jesus unclean. And so what she does is she's going to take some risk. And please understand something. Faith always takes some risk. Risk is always involved in faith. And she says, nobody else can help me except for Jesus. And she's not trying to stop him in his, his tracks. She's not doing any of that. She says, if I could just touch his clothes, I could be healed. I could just get close enough to him. So she does, and she's healed. And it's pretty interesting what happens next. Let's take a look. Verse 30. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press. Again, people are all around Jesus. And he says, who touched me? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Jesus, people are hitting you left and right. They're trying to get closer and closer to you. And you're asking who touched me? Now let me ask you a question. Did Jesus know who touched him? Of course he did. Of course he did. He's God. So why did he ask the question? It's not for Jesus' sake. Not so we can get some new information. It was for this woman. Because she touched him and then she was going away. Who touched me? Verse 32, and he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all truth. She comes and she's scared out of her mind because she thinks this rabbi might just possibly turn her in. She broke the law. She's scared. And what we see here in Jesus and what Mark is presenting to us is an endearing an endearing and a, a, a loving and tender God. You don't think God cares about the intimate details of your life. Look no further than this passage. Look at verse 34. And he said unto her, what does he call her? Daughter. A term of endearment. Meaning, you're mine. I value you. I love you. I care for you. 
you have a daughter, you know how that feels. She's mine. And he says, daughter, thy faith made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. He says, you're okay now. Because you're trusting me. Not so much my clothes. It was that you trusted me. You believed me. Think about it. There are tons of people that are rubbing up against Jesus at this point. The crowd is basically crushing around him. Only one of them does Jesus identify having faith. Except for Jairus, as we're going to see. So let's get back to him. Jesus has this interruption, which he's fine with. But as soon as he's done talking to this woman, verse 35, while he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? Your daughter has died. She's dead. She's cold to the touch. Her chest is not moving up and down anymore. And it's been like this for a while. She's dead. And they know it. Or else they wouldn't have gone through all the trouble to go through all of this crowd and basically say, just tell them to stop. She's gone. If you've ever lost a loved one, you know what that feels like. It's awful. Think about this father. Think about how he feels at this point. He goes from being filled with great hope to hearing this news, and it has to crush him. You could say maybe he has a lack of faith, but if you're in that position and you hear that news, how are you going to react? She's dead. Nobody who had ever been dead at this point had ever been made alive. Jesus turns to him, and he says, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Trust me. Just trust me. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, which would be a commotion. And them that wept and wailed greatly. You see, funerals uh, in the Middle East are, are much different than funerals of our time. You go to a funeral of our time, we, we have our, our traditions. Everyone's very quiet, very solemn. You pay your respects. You talk to the family. We usually wear dark clothing. It's not like that, especially in Jesus' time. Culturally, you're expected to wail and weep. And even it's required of you to rent your clothes, tear a piece of clothing. If you were related to that individual, you tore your piece of clothing right over your heart. If you were not related, you would tear it around your heart. These were loud affairs. And so when Jesus comes up, he hears people weeping and wailing and tearing their clothes because they know she's dead. Check out verse 39. And when Jesus was come in, he said unto them, Why make this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. It's kind of funny how these people were sad and now they're laughing at Jesus. I don't think whoever was there outside of the parents probably weren't very sincere at this point. I don't know about you, but I would find it very hard to go from mourning my heart out to laughing at someone. And they say, you've got to be kidding. Who do you think you are to show up here and say she's not dead? We know she's dead. You're crazy. They scorn him. They call him out. Probably cuss him out. Call him everything but a good person. But when he had put them all out, he says, all of you get out of here. At this point, Jesus is being kind of stern. He doesn't want anybody in this house. He says, get out now. See, a lot of people have the idea that Jesus was always soft-spoken and, and quiet. There are times where Jesus gets ticked off. I mean, when he's at the temple throwing tables over and chasing people out, he's pretty mad. So he says, get out. He takes the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. So he's got Peter, James, and John. And keep note, this is the first time 
Peter, James, and John are called out separate from all the other apostles. You're going to see this uh, reoccur several times in the Gospel of Mark, in all the Gospels, the inner three. This is the first time. He says, you three come with me, mom and dad come with me. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talithia kumai. You say, well, what is that? That is Aramaic. This is what Jesus spoke every single day. Mark chooses to put it in there. Maybe to give some emphasis to what he's saying, because Talithia means little lamb. So when Jesus walks in, he says, little lamb, wake up. It's kind of a sweet tone, isn't it? It's kind of what you would call your kids when they're, you know, one or two, little lamb. Then when they're teenagers, you call them other animals. We won't talk about, right? <laughs> we won't mention those. Little lamb, get up being interpreted as damsel, I say unto thee, arise and straightway or immediately. The damsel rose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something be given to her to eat. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? it tells all the crowd, you guys leave. Little lamb, wake up. Her parents are astonished. They knew she was dead. It wasn't hard to figure out. She has no pulse. She's cold. She's no longer breathing. And now she's up and she's walking around. Whatever ailment she had, Jesus cured her of. And he says something that he said several times before and he'll say afterwards. He says, don't tell anybody. Now, we don't know exactly why Jesus says this. Uh, the leper, if you remember him in chapter 2, Jesus told him, don't tell anybody, go and show yourself to the priest. Part of the reason we believe that is because only priests could declare someone clean from leprosy. And so basically the priest would have to say what Jesus did was legitimate. Here, we don't really know why. Maybe it was because he wanted that family to have some more privacy. If you could imagine the emotions going on, knowing your child is dead and now your child is alive, Going from having to plan a funeral to going to planning her birthday, maybe in a couple months. And maybe if, if they had taken their child and taken her outside the house and said, she's alive, maybe the crowd would have just gone nuts and taken Jesus like they had before and said, we're going to make you a king right now. Maybe that's why he did it, but I can't say for sure. But what we find out about Christ is something we've learned in all of these chapters, is that he is ultimately in control of everything. Absolutely everything. I like how Warren Wearsby puts this. He says, talking about this instance, this doesn't mean that God always must rescue his people from danger. You say, well, does God 100% time get people out of these messes? Doesn't mean he has to. No. In fact, in Acts chapter 12, remember Peter, James, and John who were in there for that event? James, in Acts chapter 12, gets arrested and he gets killed for his faith. Or it doesn't mean that Jesus will heal every single affliction. But it does mean that he holds the ultimate authority and that we need never fear. It reminds us that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Whether in sickness, whether in health, I can trust that God is ultimately in control. Whatever I'm facing, he knows what I'm facing. He wants to see me through it. He may heal me for his glory, or he may allow me to pass for his glory. That's not an easy pill for us to swallow sometimes. But again, if we follow what the Bible says, it says to die to yourself and to be alive to Christ. So we learn a couple things today. Jesus is accessible. He's approachable. He allows himself to be interrupted. We should too. You're not defined by your issues. You're defined by your faith. Your faith will mean risking things. And ultimately, Christ conquered death, and so can you. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portal. He's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home.
Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading, pleading for you and for me? Why should we linger and heed not His mercies, mercies for you and for me?